want to thank the um, uh, representatives here this afternoon for a chance to testify on this bill. My name is John O'Rear. I'm a resident of Jefferson City. I'm also a volunteer with NAMI Missouri, and our state director, Cindy, uh, was not able to be here. She may try to come back later, but she did give me her written testimony. If I could leave that for her, please. Yes. Uh, let, let's do it after you testify, and then you can, and do you want to hand it out now? And no, that's fine. fine. I'll just, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, my testimony is, um, as you can see, I'm not wearing a suit today. I'm, it's not in uh, out of disregard for you all. It's because I'm just a dad. The people with suits come in here, they're talking about dollars and cents and jobs and legal minutia and whatever, and I know that's all important, but I'm here because I'm a dad, and I have a son. My son has bipolar disorder, and he's not a loser. He graduated from Jeff City High with honors. He worked his way through high school as a courier for the city of Jefferson. So he delivered papers back and forth between the council members and the mayor and whatever. And when he graduated from high school, he got an academic scholarship to Central Methodist University that was worth over $50,000. And my son went off to college. And like happens to a lot of other people we hear about, his bipolar disorder manifests itself between the ages of 19 and 20. Within his first year, I was called because my son had, uh, I think they referred to it as behavioral problems. His grades went down the toilet, and before the first year was up, he was out of college because of his mental disorder. We brought him home, and we went down that dark rabbit hole of mental illness and trying to work our way through the healthcare system here in the state of Missouri. Because my son was too old to be kept on my group health insurance, my insurance as his parent, this was before the Affordable Health Care Act, he had no coverage. He couldn't qualify for anything. And for the first year and a half, almost two years, we went through a living hell. I saw my husband, uh, my, my son, I saw him in and out of the emergency room. I saw him in and out of the hospital. I saw him in the back of the patrol car. And after this was all over, I visited with our local sheriff here a couple of weeks ago when I testified before one of the other committees with Sheriff White. And he said, don't feel bad, John. He said, in my jail, 80% of the people that are in my jail today are there because they have alcohol or drug problems. And 80% of those people are there because they have mental illness and they've been self-medicating and that's what happened to my son so after about two years my son not only has mental illness but now he's an addict he has a dual diagnosis and it wasn't until my trouble my son got in trouble with the legal system and they referred him to drug rehab that we were able to start down the road of recovery that's the only way to get my son treatment and so here we are my son and i'm thankful that, that we got to that point because now He's two years clean and sober. He's working. He's got a part-time job. He's paying off his loans at school because his illness cost him $50,000 worth of scholarships. But he's back to work now. And as part of his recovery, that's where I came into NAMI. NAMI gave me the tools to be my son's case manager, if you will. And as part of his recovery, he was uh, went into NA, Narcotics Anonymous. And right here in Jeff City, uh, he goes about five nights a week. And some of those meetings have open meetings, and I went with him because I saw he was getting better. And he said, would you like to go, Dad? Would you like to meet my sponsor? Well, of course. And I sit in that room here in Jefferson City when there's 30 or 40 young people, and they all stand up one in an order, and they give their name, and they say, I'm an addict. And they went around that room, and my son stood up. And my son said, I'm an addict. It was like being stabbed in the heart. I could understand my son having mental illness, but the fact that he was an addict too, and he was an addict because he couldn't get treatment in our system. He became an addict because he was self-medicating himself. And I, I lived through that meeting, it was hard. And after the meeting, we went out and had, had coffee. And his sponsor says to me, he says, you know, I, I've got faith in your son, he's, he's doing well, and, and I think he has potential, he's a smart young man. But does he have a suit? And I said, well, what does having a suit have to do with his recovery? And he says, well, I tell everybody that comes in 
to the NA program that you better get yourself a good suit. Because a lot of these young people here are not going to be successful. You'll have to wear that suit to their funerals. And if your son fails, you'll have to put the suit on. <clears throat> no parents should ever have to hear that. Not in the richest country in the world. And so when we quibble over over 100% or 138% or whatever, I say, for God's sake, just do the right thing. I went to those meetings with my son about every 90 days, and in the last six months in the city of Jefferson, we have buried three young people from suicide and from drug overdose. That's the human cost that we forgot in all of this here today. What we're talking about just is an academic exercise. No, it's not. This is life or death for these people. And Representative Barnes, you say, well, less people are going to be qualified, but more people are going to be covered. 80,000 people in this state suffer from mental illness, and they don't get any treatment without this coverage being passed. So for God's sakes, let's put politics aside. Let's quit worrying about whether it's Obamacare or whether it's Barnes care or whose damn care it is. It's care for our kids. And if we don't do something here, they're going to keep putting those suits on. And I tell you, I don't ever want to have to wear my suit. Gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, and it, it